As most people probably don't know where Guyana is, that are even watching this at the moment, um, Guyana is sitting in the northeast corner of South America. It's the only English-speaking uh, country in South America. It's considered to be part of the Caribbean territory, actually, and has a closer cultural and um, a historical relationship to the Caribbean mm -hmm. territory in general. And Guyana was, uh, was a former colony of, uh, of Great Britain. I went there in the first to make a film, which is shown in the background here, called The Terror of Time. And that was after meeting Dr. Rupert Rupnerein at uh, Cornell University, uh, where I was uh, working in uh, 1975, 74, 1975. And he was from Guyana, and he started to talk about Guyana, this strange country that nobody's, nobody's ever heard about. <laughs> And, um, but had this incredible history. One of the most amazing stories he, he told me about was that Guyana had this um, amazing political history. Um, that in fact it had the first freely elected communist government in 1953, which was even before, uh, before it was, well, it was before the, before the Cuban Revolution, in uh -huh. fact. It was, that was a very personal attachment. And he said, um, well, you're a filmmaker, why don't we make a film? I said, oh, that's a good idea. And uh, we, we took a year off. Actually, Rupert uh, left uh, Cornell completely at that time and returned home, because uh, uh. Guyana was his home. And I, uh, I took a year off and, uh, from Cornell to go down and make this film that's pl playing in the background. Uh. Uh, right. And the film was uh, based upon the poetry of uh, uh, a poet named Martin Carter who many consider to be the poet laureate of, of Guyana, and deals with a period in Guyana in 1953 when they had the first uh, elections for home rule. Mm. Uh, it was the beginning of the process of decolonization. So the British uh, had decided to uh, create a constitution in which an election would occur and the, uh, the, the, the colonial uh, subjects would rule themselves in an internal way, but mm -hmm. still would be ruled from, as, a, as a colony from, from Great Britain. In short, amazingly enough, that the, uh, this very progressive uh, government got elected into power, and they lasted in, in power for about 145 days. And that, in, that, in that time, they began to uh, socialize a lot of great sections of the society, including the schools, mm -hmm. uh, working a lot with the, the unions. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they were considered a, a threat to the stability of, of, of Guyana, and the British invaded and put down this government okay. and actually arrested many of the people. And that's basically what the film was about. But it was the poetry that came out of the, at, at that period, the poetry of Martin Carter, was the subject of, yeah. of the film. The point was that we saw the poet as a, an artist of a peculiar kind of sensitivity who could make reality clearer to the rest of us. And in fact, what I said there was not a question of theory or theorization, it was what Martin Carter was actually engaged in doing. I come from the nigger yard of yesterday, leaping from the oppressor's hate and the scorn of myself. From the agony of the dark hut, in the shadow and the hurt of things, from the long days of cruelty and the long nights of pain, down to the wide streets of tomorrow, of the next day, leaping I come, who cannot see will hear. In the film, 
where you, you mix between uh, the, the, the hardcore facts mm -hmm. that you kind of rush through mm -hmm. and then you, you dwell in the poetry and, and I think two th at least two thirds of the film is basically a, a poetry collage yes. or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. I think I think you're right. What we tried to do was place the poetry in in that period, you know, and try to bring the audience to understand what was going on in the not just in Guyana but in the world. Mm. And we used archive material uh, from the period, which was um, um, <clears throat> different uh, events happening in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, as well as using the newspapers of uh, of. Guyana mm. as, as headlines to show, mm. you know, what was being said about that particular period. So, um, and, and, and basically I think the film was structured around a film that we all liked very much called Los Horos de los Hornos, The Hour of the Furnaces from Argentina. And that was the, the general idea to place uh, politics in, 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 uh, um, in, in the culture, huh? that uh, relationship between politics and culture. And poetry was the vehicle. If we go back to the shooting of this film, you uh, told me that, the, well, by the time you were shooting this film, there was mm. another government there, which were uh, basically dictatorship, and you were not really allowed to film stuff. And how, how, how were you progressing? <clears throat> yeah, well, the interesting thing here, I think, um, probably to talk about is that this is 1976 when we went to, to Guyana. And we're making a film about 1953 based upon the poetry of Martin Carter, who I told you was considered mm. a poet laureate and deeply respected even in, uh, in 1976 by the, by the people and the government. But at the time, in 1976, the government was, um, was in control of a man named Forbes Burnham, who had, um, who had been elected and retained control for 20-some years. He uh, managed to... Keep and keep Guyana isolated. Interestingly enough, by not allowing TV to be uh, part of of, uh, of the, the the mass media of Guyana, mm -hmm. so Guyana was in 1976. As far as I know, it was probably one of the last countries in the world that didn't have any TV. Cinema was a very important part of Guyanese culture because there was no TV, so people went out to the movies, mm -hmm. you know, and they uh, used the cinema to make their propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, the idea of our film was, uh, was, was accepted by the government in principle. There was no problems with, with making this film about mm -hmm. Martin Carter, nor that period, because the president, Forbes Burnham, of, the, of 1976, was also a member of this uh, 1953 government. Okay, so yeah. he was part of, part of this. Huh? Yeah. But as the film progressed, as we started to make things and work within the film center, a great deal of suspicion began to develop about, you know, certain things that we were filming and why we were filming this and mm. why, you know, why this and uh, qu questions began to come up. So um, the film came to an abrupt end <laughs> <laughs> because they became very suspicious. And, and how we realized this is when we asked to have an interview with Forbes Burnham, the president, uh, it was refused. Yeah. In fact, we never did finish the film. Yeah. <laughs> we never finished editing there. We never finished uh, the, 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 the film that we really wanted to make. Yeah. So there, that was a problem. How do you remove several thousand meters of film <laughs> uh, that you want to finish somewhere else? Yeah. And so we had to give them the impression that we, we gave up the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we, um, through connections with the West Indian cricket team, we managed to... Uh, Move the film to uh, to Trinidad, okay. and um, which was no easy task. I mean, we were literally taking out small segments of the of the negative every night well, that we were working, putting it in our bags and taking it home. So when we got to New York, where we finished the editing, um, you, you can imagine we just opened a bag and we had thousands of meters of little pieces of film that we eventually had to reassemble into the movie that we were trying to make. If you if you don't know Gayan, uh, there are some surprises in the film. There are some things that are not clear for a person that hasn't been yes, there. Uh, yes, yes. This this is a this is an interesting political discussion, I think, for filmmakers to always take into consideration. Um, first of all, I'm coming out of the anti-Vietnam War movement, and out of that movement, we some of us became internationalized. You know, so the international issues became very important to us, and that you know 
that explains perhaps my my enthusiasm to want mm. to go to Guyana. Um, and if you're if you're a committed filmmaker, I think you have to make a, a, a decision at some point. For whom are you making this film? And we had made the decision that we were making this film for the Guyanese people. So if you're making a film for the Guyanese people, or you're making a film for the Danish people, mm. well, it's a little bit insulting if you say, well, we're going to make this film about you know life in of teenagers in Copenhagen, mm. and then you begin the film with a map of Copenhagen, and, <laughs> you know, when you show locations, you know. It's a, so if you think about it that way, mm. uh, that explains why the film doesn't have a lot of this didactic information mm. that you think you would have in a kind of National Geographic format, mm. because we we made it for Guyanese, so mm. you know, you're not going to show start the film with a map of Guyana. Yeah, because people. you have these clips uh, with the publicities of uh, in Guyanese newspaper of white. Uh, woman, for instance, mm. uh, using a soap and stuff mm. like that, and uh, there is like not even one percent of white people living in Guyana. Yeah. But there is a lot of other nationalities. There are, as you said, there is Afro, uh, African people and in yeah. in Indian Hindu, people, Hindu people, yeah. Indian Hindus, yeah, and, 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 and indigenous people. Yeah. Ten, ten percent or so indigenous. There is also Chinese people. There are Chinese yeah. people, and there are Portuguese people, and there are Lebanese people. These would be the of, of the white of the white yeah. sector. You would say that they would be Portuguese and Lebanese, mostly, uh -huh. mostly representing the merchant class. Yeah. Um, that would make up Guyana. The only thing I've heard about Guyana ever mm. uh, was. Uh, this Jim Jones sect mm -hmm. that m there was mass suicide. Yeah. Uh, this was while you were there, basically, or was? Well, that happened after we we had left mm -hmm. about um, a year later after uh, fil the film. We did have contact with some of the people from Jonestown. They they were in the Georgetown area. I never went up to Jonestown, so I never saw the place. Mm -hmm. But you're indeed you're right, you know, that made Guyana put Guyana on the map. Mm -hmm. If anything, they say Guyana I said, Oh, isn't that where Jonestown was? And mm -hmm. that that's up until today. Mm -hmm. I mean if I people I ask talk to they say, Yeah, that's where Jonestown mm -hmm. was. So I never really we never really had contact with those people, but that was a very unusual thing and a very um uh bizarre and strange thing, which we're still Till till this day, I'm not completely satisfied with the suicide story, mm -hmm. but it seems to have enough credibility that that's really what happened. Mm -hmm. um, part of part of that situation was that Jones was really building a state within the state and was gaining a lot of power in the interior. Now, he had done something that Burnham would like to have done and never succeeded in doing. The Guyanese are a coastal people. The ma major part of the population lives along the coast. Why? Because that's where the rice farms were, that's where the sugar plantations were of the colonial times. That's where Georgetown, the city is, it's a port. And the interior of Guyana is, you know, is rainforest, mm. jungle, dense, you know, virgin territory with, you know, some scattered uh, Indian mm. tribes, but very, very hostile, you mm. know, to, to, uh, to anyone that wants to live there, you know. So to, to carve out a place in the interior and survive and build an infrastructure was quite amazing. And Jones did this, mm. you know, with his four or five hundred American uh, associates. Were these white Americans? Or? Uh, no, they were mostly black. Mm. They are mostly black. Some white, but mostly they were a African Americans mm. people, yeah, from uh, coming out of a church in San Francisco. Mm. I do believe that Jones became a megalomaniac. Mm. You know? I mean, he obviously, you know, his, his ideas got extremely distorted. Mm. But the initial structure of his idea was very, very interesting. Mm. It's no different than what was happening all over, you know, creating hippie communes, mm. communes so you had in Denmark. Yeah. You know? I mean, these, these were things of, these were part of, part of that, that period, mm. you know, creating the alternative uh, mm. cultures. But interesting enough, in, in relation to Jonestown and the whole idea of what happened in Jonestown, which was, um, as may, maybe your audience doesn't know, but uh, the idea that jo Jones, uh, um, was threatened by the Americans that were closing in on him, you know, and he was uh. threatened that the, the place would be taken over. And um, they, they made a suicide pact. So they, they all took this Kool-Aid, uh, which is a soft drink, uh, we call a sap, you know, uh, with water, with uh, cyanide in it. So everyone took this, drank the cyanide mm. and then laid down and died, um, including Jones himself. Interesting enough, there was no real autopsies done on the, on the bodies okay. afterwards. They were, they were decomposed, terribly decomposed in the jungle very quickly. And um, 
But that idea of cyanide, you know, cyanide and death, comes back in Guyanese history in a film that we did later called Poison in the Lifeline, which is about the Oh My Gold Mine, which is the largest gold mine, one of the largest gold mines in the world, in Guyana, when the cyanide spill of four, let's see now, it's seven years ago, six years ago. After the government told the people that the water was safe, President Jagan visited the area to calm the citizens. The credibility of this company went down because they have given undertakings, especially from the last breakage we had in May, that everything will be in place, will be put in place correctly. And then this disaster occurred not too long after. So that many people, even though they may be telling, giving correct facts, people have lost confidence in the company's words. Are you here as a concerned president? Or are you representing the government as a shareholder of Oh My Gold Mines Limited? Yeah! No. The press has informed us, informed us that Omai has the temerity to tell us they're going to throw another discharge, another discharges into our rivers as time goes by and they see it fit to do so. Well, then it is cause for concern because if you're going to have injections of small doses of poison, well, eventually we'll all die. They use cyanide to, to um to leach, to, to get the gold out of the rock. Uh -huh. And cyanide is used as a material to, to, to bind the gold. Okay. Uh, because cyanide binds heavy minerals okay. together. Okay. So, and then they take the cyanide, after they take this, the gold out of the rock, and they put the cyanide in a big pond, uh -huh. a big lake. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the dam of this lake broke. And all the cyanide-infected in, uh, water ran into the main river of Guyana, the Escribo uh -huh. River. And this was one of the biggest mine disasters in but history. Many people died, I guess. Not many people died, mm. fortunately. And one of the reasons for that is that the Esquibo River in Guyana is rather large. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like putting it in the toilet. I mean, it's okay. flushing continuously. But everything in the area around there uh, died, uh, literally died. All fish, animals, uh, everything died. And people got terribly ill. Yeah. People got really ill because the people depend on that water. They, they, they bathe in it, they use it for cooking yeah. and, and all this. It's clean, clean water. Yeah. Yeah, so when you say cyanide yeah. and that cyanide is in our water, you know, Jonestown goes right into, into yeah. their uh, uh, thinking. Yeah. So eventually, in 1982, I got the chance to go to, uh, uh, to Suriname, mm -hmm. also because of uh, Root Narayan, because he, he said, uh, he called me up and said, uh, Ray, um, there's something going to happen in Suriname. Can you interest Dutch TV in, in going there? Well, I did. And, um, and indeed, something did happen. And I re I, uh, it, it was, Suriname was in the midst of a, of a, of a revolution. They had a, a successful revolution, a, a military coup. And um, I remained there for four years. Mm. I got a job in TV and, and uh, did, did a lot of film projects in, in, in Suriname, which put me right next door to Guyana. Eventually, Forbes Burnham died during that time when I was there, and I went back into mm. Guyana. I understand that you're very attracted to... Uh, somehow, this whole area, the whole Caribbean area is... is in turmoil during these years and you, you said you were on your way to Grenada for instance yeah for some, when I went to Suriname I really wanted to go to uh, Grenada you know mm. that was um, Maurice Bishop I had done some work with him in, in England and um, he had come up there to make some speeches and if if the audience probably no one knows about what happened in Grenada but Maurice Bishop created this very um, uh, progressive uh, almost revolutionary government in, in, in Grenada during that period in early 1980s. One of the things that they were going after was tourism and um, in, in what we would call echo tourism in a way, like tourists coming but don't don't bring in sirloin steaks from New York to mm. feed them, but feed them the local fish and mm. the local vegetables and that sort of thing. Uh, don't build large hotels, but build 
comfortable uh, uh, dwellings that you are, are, are um, that that reflect how people live in the area. It was a very interesting concept. Mm. But he also had to build a new airport because it's the only airport for small planes, and he was busy building a very large runway, uh, which the Cubans were helping with Cuban workers, and it was being built by uh, with by English engineers. But what happened then in Grenada? You told me this crazy story about. Well, um, <laughs> there was. Uh, w Yeah, who, who knows what happened really, <laughs> but uh, Bishop, uh, in short, Bishop was uh, um, caught in the middle of a, a counter coup and uh, some of his own men turned against him, very Shakespearean kind of uh, story. Uh, you're talking about Grenada, who has an army of probably 150 men, <laughs> mostly using, um, you know, rifles and, mm. you know, not, I mean, semi-automatic weapons. But um, this coup took, took the weapons, who were locked in an armory, And the, and, and the ensuing battle, uh, Bishop was uh, was was killed mm. uh, in trying to hold hold his position. And then shortly after that, there was the Americans uh, invaded mm. and and um, put down the whole uprising totally um, under under Ronald Reagan. And one of the reasons that happened, one of the reasons this all got started, was because this building this gigantic runway. Uh, Reagan had sent over spy planes, U-2 planes, and, and, and took photographs of this of this happening. And you could see these Cuban flags and these Cuban workers there, I guess, from these things, and put that on television and said, this is becoming a very dangerous country. What Bishop did at that time was said, called up ABC TV in America and said, well, hey, come up, come come down. Mm. We'll fly you down here, come down. And they, they walked around and filmed everything on the ground that Reagan the day before had shown as, as, as uh, from a spy plane. Mm. And uh, indeed, there were Cubans there. There were retired Cuban workers. Mm -hmm. These guys were like 58, 60, 65, mm. who were just were committed to helping build this thing. They weren't soldiers. I mean, they were real just advisors mm. and, and workers, um, skilled laborers. Mm. Yeah. That must have made somebody like Ronald Reagan pretty angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he, he uh, uh, however, this counter coup got organized. You know, I'm not saying I can't say you know who did this, mm. but you know, it happened. And. And, Grenade, and uh, Bishop was killed. It gave uh, uh, enough reason for Ronald Reagan to uh, to uh, send down uh, 20 ships and 5,000 troops and invade the island and, and, and bomb the hell out of mm. it, you know, mm. for, for a few hours, you know. But wasn't it very tough in this environment uh, to be American? I mean, I mean, you were you were the obvious, you know, obviously coming from the. <laughs> Well, I think I think fortunately, you know, people politic politically aware people realize that there are Americans and there are Americans. Mm. You know, <laughs> I don't think Ronald Reagan or or, or even uh, George Bush represents Americans. Mm. It's quite obviously when you're only winning an election by five percent that you know that that's not the way, way all Americans mm. think. Mm. And if I've done anything in my life, I think I've been a good ambassador for my country. Mm -hmm. You know, I've shown that there's another another way that Americans think about things. And, uh,